Looks like we're going to have a cozy crowd. That's great. So my name is Chris Hilgenfeld. I am an attorney at Davis Grimm Payne and Mara. The only thing we do is we represent businesses in labor and employment matters, and so we're exclusively dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis. Our primary clientele are small to medium-sized businesses, some larger, but mostly small to medium-sized in all types of industries. We represent a number of people in the restaurant industry and a number of people in the hotel industry. This talk today, I'm not going to talk about what the definition of sexual harassment is. I'm not going to talk about what the definition of sex discrimination is. We're going to go through the practical effects of what we are facing today in every industry, societal really, and then walk through it. What does it mean? And before I forget, if anyone's interested in the CLE continuing, continuing education, not CLE, continuing education, sign up here afterwards. And also we have handouts afterwards of training that the uh, association puts on for its members and includes sexual harassment training, but you'll also see uh, alcohol training, food safety, bloodborne pathogens, a number of other training sessions. When we're walking through this and we're kind of talking about some of this, ask questions. We don't have a ton of people here, so we shouldn't be intimidated by the crowd. And then when you go through it, uh, the only thing I ask, you can ask anything, even if it's not directly on point, just remember we are taping, so let's make them all hypotheticals. Let's not talk about Joe in the, the, the kitchen area. So the Me Too movement, as most of you know, it caught steam here just a few years ago. Alyssa Milano sent out a tweet regarding uh, our, our buddy Weinberg. And it caught storm. Now, this was not the start of the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement actually has been going on for over a decade now. And it was started by uh, an, a lady, Tarana Burke, who was into sociology. And she started that movement. And it took quite a while, it took Alyssa Milana and the Hollywood movement to kind of push it to the forefront. Now, I would be shocked if anyone has not heard of the Me Too movement at this point in time. Now what I often hear is people, however, don't understand how it really affects them. They'll read the tabloids, they'll see, okay, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Riley, Bill Cosby, um, but they don't understand how it's going to affect their business, their jobs, and how we are moving on. And we need to think about sexual harassment discrimination in an entirely new way than we have thought about it in the past. And one of these names on here, Alex Kaczynski, I highlight because you probably have not heard that name, but he's a Ninth Circuit judge. So the Ninth Circuit's the Washington, Oregon, California area. And he's a judge who ended up getting booted from this position. I think he resigned ultimately. But you'll see how widespread effect it is. That it's not just a Hollywood issue that we're talking about. It affects, it'll affect all of you in going through it. And according to the Me Too webpage, probably now over 18 million at the time this was done, 17.7 million reported sexual assaults in about a decade period. So since 90, or two decades, 98 to 2017. That most of the people that you're working with have been involved in some of this. And the restaurant and hotel industries are even more susceptible to some of these issues. You're not only going to have your normal employment relationships, which a lot of businesses have, but you're also going to have customer and vendor issues, which are going to be unique to your industries. And the fact of how we deal in the hospitality industry is just going to be slightly different on how that goes forward. And so what are you going to do about it? And you have a lot of businesses that, David put in a great term, they come from a Leadite situation. They're not used to computers. They're just kind of going to other businesses. They're now scheduling online. They have chats online about changing shifts. They're moving more and more to an informational page. And then what happens when you have these informational issues that end up getting moved into your workplace? When coworkers are talking about these things, it changes the work environment. 
even taking aside the Me Too movement, employment litigation and discrimination litigation has gotten very, very expensive for all businesses. In the last 20 years, employment lawsuits have risen by 400%. You'll see average compensatory awards are almost half a million dollars. Most businesses, it's not a shock to say most businesses, especially with a thin line, cannot support that type of case and that type of litigation. So what's gonna happen? And then what this is not talking about, but we'll get into in a bit, in the state of Washington, if you have a business here and you are a supervisor or a manager, you might even be personally liable. So you're not only risking the companies that you're working for, but it might be that 500,000 may be your house. There's a very real personal reason to take this seriously, as well, to, as, well as the other reasons. So how are we going to get to the point where you have Me Too, which I have a number of restaurant businesses, every single one of them that I represent, this is a huge issue. They have traditionally a younger workforce. Traditionally, the, move, the workforce will move around from area to area, and it's true with the hospitality just in general. There is generally alcohol available, uh, whether the employees are drinking it on there or not, it's a part of the work environment. And what I hear more often than not, that's just how we do it here. That's always happened. You don't have to worry about us, everyone who works here understands. Maybe true, my experience is it's probably not. So when you're looking at this chart, and some of these are a little hard, easier to read than some of them, think of it this way. If you want to be in that far left zone, and what makes harassment and discrimination hard for some people is there's a lot of gray area. Some things maybe aren't bad by themselves, but they're, they're just creepy. People act a little weird. Some people, you are just begging to get sued. If you take through some of those lines. Some of this, you know, it happens once or twice. We can handle that sort of situation. What happens when it continually happens? And most of you here, does anybody here not have a zero tolerance harassment policy? I'm assuming you mostly do. The confusion that a lot of people have is zero tolerance does not mean that you fire somebody for the first slightly inappropriate joke. What it does mean is you don't ignore the slightly inappropriate joke. You deal with it directly. And that's one of the hard parts about it as well. Uh, a lot of these that we'll talk about this morning are direct communications. They're boundaries. Just like if your three-year-old gets out of line, you set the boundaries. You're not doing it to be mean. You're not doing it to be cruel. You're doing it to set a standard. And the workforce is not a lot different. It's important that when you're setting as a manager, or supervisor, or perhaps an owner, that you're setting clear standards and boundaries for your employment to work upon. And so that's what you're talking about here. And then you'll talk about this far left right corner here. And you know, some of this seems very easy, you know, telling employees she's not getting a promotion because you want a man in that role. That seems pretty obvious. I had a Washington client who let go of a woman because she was pregnant. So just because something is obvious doesn't mean it's not still happening. So we should reevaluate how we're going through these types of issues, what you're doing in your employment and then why you're doing it. One of the issues that is going to come up is the pay equity. That seems easy, and sometimes it is. You say, we wanna, we wanna pay people based on performance and how they do the job. Some people are better, we don't care if they're man, woman, transgender, we don't care. If they're a good employee, we may expect we may have to pay them more. Nothing wrong with that. 
100% legal. Also, for employees, we don't necessarily want to pay employees. We want to pay employees what we can to get them here. New employees, you don't know how good they are. If they work for $16 an hour there, we think we can hire them for $16.50, and we're going to hire them for $16.50. One of the problems that employers are facing, and this is there's new legislation in Washington that may address some of this, uh, which is going to make it tougher. What if that previous employer was paying them $16.50 because, or $16 because they were a woman, and so they were discriminatorily paying them? What happens when you're using that same pay rate? It becomes a hard issue. And so it's hard sometimes to fit in, but what's important is not necessarily that you all have all the answers all the time. It's that you give it some thought. You look into some of these issues that we're doing and how it's being affected by some of this. Can you tell us why it might have not more I'm not sure, but at the end you'll see, I have an email there, so if anyone wants any of this information, just let me know and I'll be happy to send it to you. Kind of going through this, one thing to remember that, uh, is everyone in here at least a supervisor level position, I'm assuming? You are acting on behalf of your company. When you're doing something, it's just the same as if right here if the Hyatt did something. The supervisor does and acts in a certain way. And that's true for all your other supervisors and it's true for all your other managers. It's equally true if they do nothing, as is that the company did nothing. And you'll see that part of where the Me Too movement's gone out, everyone hear about Google had a one day strike shut down where essentially uh, the whole female workforce went on strike for a whole day. Google's seen as a fairly progressive company. It's affecting Google, it's going to affect all of us on that. And a lot of what their actions were complaining of were how individual supervisors or managers handled certain situations. When you look at the Thing about what most of us are concerned about, it may be, one, we want to do the right thing, but also, we don't want to be sued. No one wants to be sued. They did a study regarding medical malpractice claims. You're like, well, what's that have to do with me? The one thing they found out with medical malpractice claims, it had nothing to do with the skill of the doctor played no part in who got sued, who didn't. It had very little to do with the facts of the case. It had almost, no, it had somewhat, but not a lot to do with the type of surgery that was involved, like high risk surgery as opposed to low risk surgery. The number one correlation was how much time the treating physician that handled the surgery spent with the patient. They spent, and this piece I always mess up, but if they spent like over seven minutes, they were much, much less likely to get sued than if they spent under seven minutes. Like that's all it took. It took the person that was going through the surgery to feel like they had a one-on-one -on -one connection, that the surgeon felt like they were trying to do their best job, and that was important. And as frontline supervisors and managers, think about that in your environment. The people, your employees, the number one thing you can do for them is to make them feel important, respected, and that they have a voice in this. And we'll talk about some of these other things, but that's important to remember. That these are people with very human reactions, and the Me Too movement, sexual harassment, is almost always an emotional reaction to something. So what are we going to do to help that person in the emotional reaction? And it can be very hard. Because we've all had people in the workforce that are complainers. You, we all, there is not a single work environment where you don't have somebody who has, two or three people have 90% of the complaints. That's just how it all works out. So it can be very hard then that those persons are being heard. But as a, in this position, it's important. 
And you'll see that oftentimes you'll go through it and you'll see supervisors who don't do anything. And oftentimes you'll talk to the supervisor and ask, why didn't you do anything? I didn't really think they minded. Either the woman or the man, they seemed kind of into it. It was just innocent flirtation. What happens when the innocent flirtation goes too far? Which will often happen. And that's some of the issues you kind of get through here. What about off duty? Shift's over, we're gonna go grab drinks with everybody. Everything's fine, but maybe some comments were made. If you're a supervisor or manager off duty and you are affecting the work environment, you may be creating the potential for harassment claim. Whether that's asking someone out that they don't want to be asked out, whether it's saying a crude, inappropriate thing or touching someone at the workplace, had a case here, manager goes out, has drinks with a coworker. Things that he took the reaction one way, grabbed her, then we're dealing with a lawsuit. About $150,000 later, we were done. But that's an expensive lesson. And then part of the lesson is that company had training. That company told the people the right thing but it was the off-duty conduct by manager or supervisor. It has a direct impact on what's happening. It doesn't even have to be what happens when you have two employees who are off-duty. They go on a date, and the date ends poorly. It may affect the work environment. When it does, you are gonna be putting yourself in a higher position. Now, you're never going to get your employees not to date one another, especially in the hospitality industry. That's like the number one dating pool. I recognize that. But it's equally important to understand what are we going to do when it doesn't work out well. And there's a difference between people who just, it didn't work out and they move on and they're respectful. To ones where if you go back to this other one, they start, it, they start staring and standing too close and a little too stalkerish behavior that starts going on. And that's happened as well. Even though it may be happening off duty, it's going to be affecting on duty. So you're gonna to have to deal with it. And one of the results, I hope you walk away from this, is one solution absolutely is not to do nothing because it happens and it's off duty. I cannot tell you how many clients I have who say, well, I don't really know, it was hearsay. And one, attorneys rarely know what hearsay is, so I'm pretty certain my clients don't know what hearsay is. It doesn't matter how you learned about something. If you think it's true and it has some credibility, or it's possible that it's true, you know about it. Now, if you know something that you've heard and you said so-and-so, and you're like, well, that's not true because that guy was working on Thursday. I saw him. There's no way he was at that concert. Then you know it's not true. But most of the time, it's in the realm of we're going to treat this as it could be true. It may not be true. You're going to have to treat it as true. If you hear two people talking and just gossiping, you now know about it. And you're going to have to take some action about it. And that's true even if you're not there. You just hear about it secondhand or thirdhand. And we'll get into what the investigation means. It doesn't mean that you hire someone to come in and they spend three weeks and they interview everybody and you bring in the FBI. That's not that's what's required. Investigations can be very short and concise and targeted. They can be broader. But every single complaint that you know about has to be investigated. And we start getting into what are some of the common errors? It's never happened here. Or another one is, I know Joe, he's never done that to me. That may be true. 
doesn't mean Joe didn't do it to somebody else. The off the record conversations, and this can be hard. I had a client two weeks ago call, and it was a sexual assault off work, two employees. And she came in and says, I don't want you to do anything. I'm not reporting it to the police. I just want you to know, I want this off the record. I don't want you to do anything about it. That's a hard position. But what's the one thing that person can't do? Do nothing. You know about it. Now, it doesn't mean you, you, you can't be respectful to that person. It doesn't mean that you, you cannot investigate, you cannot do other things. And this was not, there was an alternative here where you didn't have to call in the police, but it certainly is an issue. And it doesn't have to rise to that level. What you'll often hear is, I just want you to know, but Joe kind of creeps me out. I don't really want you to do anything about it. I'm just letting you know. Well, when they tell you about it, the truth is they want it to stop, if nothing else. Otherwise, they wouldn't be having this conversation. The other one, this number three. Yeah, that's my friend. We have this, we have this give and take. Um, you see this a lot with um, race relations. I can use this term. I had a client dealt with, uh, I don't know if anyone here watched the David Chappelle show. It was funny. Highly inappropriate for work, but it was funny. What's probably not funny is bringing over a friend to watch it at work that is your subordinate and making them sit there and watch it with you. That's uncomfortable. And just because you may be friends doesn't mean friends can't cross lines too. And just because someone hasn't said something, if you've witnessed something, that draws a line. That's, that's not what we're about. They may have that environment, and that's great. You can have that friendship off work, but when you're in the work, there's a work appropriate behavior. Fourth, it was just a joke. Come on, can't we take a joke here? And jokes are hard because there's a wide spectrum, and a lot of it's perfectly fine. It's good, you want to have a good joking environment. You want to have people who enjoy coming to work. You want to laugh, you want to have a good time. You also probably don't want the jokes targeted at certain people's race, religion, sex, national origin, gender, those types of things. That's tough. And it's also probably going to be tough if the jokes are going to be too targeted mean-spirited, then just because it's fun for four or five people doesn't mean it's fun for that person as well. Not checking in, and it amazes me, but especially with small to medium-sized businesses, maybe you don't have an HR department, uh, you may have somebody who has dual functions in that function, maybe your HR department's not really involved in moving people, um, what's the number one way that a lot of companies try to solve a problem employee? They just move them to a different division or a different shift. Or, uh, hey, it's not working out here, we're gonna give them to that supervisor. And that's fine, but the other supervisor better understand. It's one thing if it's a performance issue and they're just not, maybe they can't deal with the public and so you get them away from the public, they're great. But if you're moving them for other reasons, what you don't want to have happen is, well, he harassed this woman, so he moved into a different shift. He harassed this woman, moved into a different shift, and his third supervisor doesn't know about any of the others. That's going to get you into trouble. Another one that I hear continually is, it wasn't a formal complaint. As soon as I hear the word formal, I know there's a problem. Because it means that ah, I knew there was a problem, but they didn't put it in writing, it wasn't triple coded, I didn't get it going to all the departments. That's not what's required. What's required is that we know about it. And if you know about it, we need to take action about it. 
Number seven, you're seeing more and more. I saw a complaint on Facebook, or maybe it was Twitter, or maybe it was something else that is going on that I have no idea about. Uh, but once you kind of get into this realm of complaints, especially in the work environment, you're gonna need to take action. And it may be just bringing the person in and they say, ah, I was just blowing off steam. I didn't really mean it. Maybe that's all it is, and you, that's your investigation. But you're gonna have to do something about it. With all of these steps, when we're walking through it, what we wanna do is try to prevent all of it. That's gonna be your best, your best source. I use construction sites because has anyone seen those pictures of the construction sites about 100 years ago and you see people on a crane that's about 1,000 feet in the air it feels like, there's no fall protection, they're just walking out on top of an iron beam. That scares the bejesus out of me every time I see it. The truth is, 20 years ago, they may have had fall protection at that freight, but they probably didn't have it at 15 feet. They weren't necessarily wearing hard hats. They weren't necessarily wearing their gloves and protective gear. Now you would be shocked. Almost any construction site you walk to. If you walk down to downtown Seattle, you go through every single construction site, they all have their PPE on. You'll see signs everywhere. You'll see supervisors immediately address an issue. That is zero tolerance. It's not that someone would get fired if they didn't have the hard hat on, they may, but it gets addressed immediately. And so that's where you wanna to get to with harassment and discrimination. It's that you wanna make it so clear about what's acceptable behavior. And then when you see it, you push it back in line. If you hear a joke, you say, hey, 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 we're good. We're, this is how we behave. Where you see behavior, any behavior, you are corrected immediately. And you let your employees know what's the policy. They get trained on it. Ideally, they're gonna have training when they go through this, when they're hired. Preferably, it's not the training I got when I got into the restaurant industry where they stuck me in a room in a cabinet, they turned on the VHS, they put in a film that lasted 20 minutes that maybe I stayed awake for, probably didn't. And then they shut off, came back, and said, okay, now go to work. And then you didn't hear about it again, ever. There is nothing wrong with video training. It does need to be implemented and used with other forms. Whether that's just a talk from your supervisor before you get started, saying, hey, just so you understand, this is our harassment policy. We take it very seriously. If you have any questions, let me know. We do not tolerate it. It can be very simple, but that's going to be more powerful than sitting in a room for an eight-hour video session that they may or may not be awake on. And then the other piece is, how do we emphasize it's important? You don't do it just once. It doesn't mean you're doing it weekly. It does mean you want to probably have a plan. How are we going to have this regular plan? Are we going to do it yearly? Sure. Is it going to be with an all staff meeting? That's fine. Is it going to be yearly with sporadic things put in? That's terrific. There needs to be a plan in place. And the other piece of it is, when you see people who have violated your policy, it's going to happen. In fact, come on in. When you do, in fact, I would argue that the best companies and the best harassment policies I have seen have continual violations. They're small. They're bad jokes. They're a comment that probably got misconstrued somehow, wasn't intentional, wasn't mean-spirited, but it probably crossed the line and it's dealt with immediately. It's dealt with by the supervisors who lets the person know you crossed the line. It also goes back to the victim, whether they complained or not. It can be, we saw a joke, 
you didn't complain about it, but it crossed the line. We've told the person it's not going to happen again. We just want you to understand. Because it's equally important that everyone understands what the rules are. And if you're continually doing it, you're going to have people that step out of it. That's fine. And it doesn't mean you fire them. It does mean you take action with them. And with the training, the, the monitoring, keeping track, that's, that's purely the attorney in me. Because what always happens is I will talk to the client and ask, we have training all the time. All right. Every month we have a monthly training where we have a, cra a crew meeting and we just emphasize this. Okay, do you have um, notes of what you talked about? Oh no, we don't take any notes. Okay, do you have any sign-up sheets? Oh no, we don't do sign-up sheets. That's not how we operate. Okay, and then when I talk to the employee, the employee's like, I never even heard that we had a sexual harassment policy. That's invariably what it's gonna be. So it is important to keep track. It is important that you kind of go through this on that piece. But the biggest piece is when you're walking through it, it you know, is respect and civility. That, that everyone in your workplace should feel like they're a respected individual. It does not mean you don't discipline. It does not mean that you allow lower standards to do your job. It does mean that if you are disciplining someone for not performing properly, let's focus on the not performing piece of it. It means that if you see someone that's acting disrespectfully, that you address that. That's true if it's your supervisor, if it's your manager, it's true if it's your best employee. It's important to address it. And most of this, is a top-down issue. If your top-level managers and your owners are not respectful of one another and they are not respectful of the workplace, you can never expect your employees to act respectfully. It's impossible. And so that can be difficult, especially for small businesses that are family-run perhaps and have acted in a certain way their entire time frame. Like, that's just how we do things. And I'm not going to tell you you have to switch. That's your call. I am telling you, going back to the beginning, it's a costly decision. And it's very costly when you think you're putting your business on the line or, think about it again, you're putting your house on the line. It's not a decision I would make. But each person has to look at it their own self. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about investigations. Mostly because I want you to understand you're probably already doing investigations now. You just don't call them that. And that's fine. But when we get a complaint, as we get through, like any complaint, we're going to investigate. And what does that mean? Sometimes it means a lot. And sometimes it means, well, I witnessed it, so I knew what happened. He said a bad joke, she laughed, they went on. So I went to him and said, look, you, you can't, that joke's inappropriate in the workplace, kind of stepped over a line, let's not happen, have, have, happen, have it happen again. He said, come and see. And then I went to her and said, look, I know you didn't complain about it, that joke crossed the line, just want you to understand that's inappropriate. That's your investigation, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it is an investigation, even if it happens on the spot. Equally true, if someone comes in with a formal complaint about ongoing behavior by your supervisor that's related to how they, how they schedule shifts, uh, maybe you have to interview 15 different people. Maybe you have to interview the complainant. That may be possible. Each incident is going to be its own little world that you're going to have to look at. But here's some things to take into account. We want to all address. We want prompt, appropriate corrective action. If you find out that your harassment policy wasn't violated, that there was no merit to the complaint, there's nothing wrong with not taking corrective action. That may be the most appropriate thing. Never retaliate. 
Seems easy. Happens all the time. Retaliation is broad, very broad. If someone comes to you and says, I can't work with that person because of how they talk to me, X, Y, and Z. If your immediate solution is to move the victim to a different shift, you're putting yourself in problems. It doesn't mean you have to, if you have to exchange shifts, but if you're going to put the victim in a position where they weren't in before, you probably should talk to your attorney about it first because they're going to ask you to put on the brakes. Now, if the victim wants to move shifts, she goes, no, no, I, I really prefer this other shift. I want to do it anyway. There's nothing wrong with that. But you need to think about what it's going through. You need to think about your reaction. And then the last one, and this should happen with all complaints, formal or informal, you close the loop. Going back to the doctor's example on seven minutes getting sued, a, one of the number one harassment issues I deal with is when you sit in depositions, we're halfway through litigation, and it comes out why they sued, and like, I complained about this on three separate occasions and they did nothing. And you talk to the client like, well, no, on the first occasion we did this, on the second occasion we did that, on the third occasion we did this. They just never told the person who complained. So to the person who complained, it was this and nothing happened. That's important. Does that mean you tell them exactly what you did? Maybe not. You don't need to necessarily get into what type of disciplinary action you took with another employee. That may not be appropriate. But there's nothing wrong with saying, look, we looked into it. We've given, dis we've given disciplinary action we think is appropriate. They know this has never happened again. If it does happen again, come back to us. We'll fix it. Because what, what do we want? We want the people as much of a pain as it feels like at the moment. We want the victims and the people who are complaining to come to us. What do we not want them to do? We don't want them to go to another attorney. We don't want them to go online and all of a sudden making a cause about it, about how they're being treated at work, whether it's through Glassdoor or Facebook or whatever it is. We want them to know that if there's a problem, we'll correct it. A lot of this we've kind of gone through. I get the last one is usually more of an issue with larger clients or corporate clients. They're like, well, we have a policy that says all complaints have to be in writing. That's fine. You can put the complaint in writing. Just don't make the victim do it. The victim can come to the person. They can make a verbal complaint. And the supervisor or manager can put it into writing and then process it up. There's nothing that needs to, says you need to change how you're handling them. What we don't want to do is if they don't think about seriously enough about their complaint to put it in writing and sign their name to it, I'm not going to treat it seriously. I understand the sentiment, but that's not what the law requires. Kind of going through what's involved in an investigation. Almost always, if you receive a complaint, you're going to want to interview the complainant. That's part of making it seem and that you're taking it seriously. You sit down with them. You get everything. You get the history. Because more likely than not, it's not a single incident. It usually is a culmination of events that led to a single incident. So you're going to want to understand it all. If there's any evidence, you want to look at the evidence. You want to pull it. You're going to want to interview the person who is being accused, even if you said, well, there's video footage that showed that he or she acted in a certain way. So we know they did. We don't need to talk to them. Talk to them anyway. If they're lying, that's great. That is not a problem. 
If they've done what they were accused of, then they lie about it, it's probably not someone you want in your workforce. And they've just made your job a lot easier. This has put the review and the evidence twice. I felt like it was doubly important, apparently. Uh, interview other people that are involved in it, other witnesses. It doesn't mean you have to do it all times. There's a certain amount of how serious is the crime to warrant how serious the investigation is going to be, and that's fine. But if you have a number of witnesses who are dealing with harassment, interview them all. Interview them. And we'll come through about credibility determinations because that's one of the hardest things that people have. And it's one of the hardest parts about being a supervisor or manager is making those credibility determinations. The last point, take notes of all of this. In the state of Washington, does anybody have an idea of how long it can take before someone has to bring a lawsuit? Three years. But it's really more than three years, because it's three years from the last action. It may go back to things that happened in 1994. So if you have notes of it, I don't know about you, I do not remember 1994 very well at all. I certainly wouldn't remember if I conducted an investigation or not. That's why your notes are going to be very important because the time frame is so long. And it's going to help. Our memories are fuzzy. They change. And if you have notes of what happened, it will help you go back to them. And then always reach a conclusion. The conclusion may be that the uh, complaint was founded. It may be that it was unfounded. There's no support for it. It may be we couldn't tell one way or the other so this is what we did. But there should be some type of conclusion. Don't make a conclusion about the law. Make a conclusion about the facts. Did event X occur? Did Jimmy say that? Did he do that? Did she do that? Did she say that? Uh, the second point is one of the hardest points that we have with supervisors in looking at credibility. Oftentimes, I will talk to people and they say, well, he said this, she said that, so we can't do anything. That's not true. You get to make a decision. And in fact, you should make a decision. And the EEOC puts out a list of credibility investigation factors. I'd be happy to send it to anybody who's interested. And one of those investigation factors is they look at, is there supporting documentation? Is their story inherently plausible? You will hear some people say something that is far beyond plausibility. You're like, that, I, that just would not happen. That is fine to take into account. And just because you have one person who said one thing and another person who said another, doesn't mean you can't take action. It also doesn't mean you can't take the other person's action and said, everything considered, we do not think this happened. Here is why, X, Y, and Z. That's perfectly fine. But if you're using these determinations, it's going to help you in the process. And then when you're closing the loop, you're still gonna wanna close the loop. Now you probably don't wanna call the victim a liar, even if that's how you're feeling about it at the time. But you are gonna say, look, there wasn't sufficient evidence to show this happened. Please let us know if it does happen. We will continue to investigate. They may not like it. In fact, they probably will not like your response. They still, my experience has been, that response is infinitely better than not hearing back at all. Even when they don't like the response. If it's done in a professional, respectful manner, and it lets them know, like, look, we, we understand if something does happen, we will take care of it. Whether you have a written report or not about this will probably depend on the gravity of the claim. Some don't warrant it, and that's fine. Some look at it like we really should have a written report about what's going on in this instance. In this instance. Some of that may be if you talk to your attorney and they say, 
I'm going to tell you to write a report, so we're going to keep this confidential because we're a little concerned about future litigation. That may happen. It may be, no, what are we going to do about it? That's fine. We don't need a report, and there's nothing wrong with that as well. But it's one of the steps you probably should go through, the thought process on it. And then back, just close the loop at the end. Are we on time? Also, kind of lessons of where we're coming from. Uh, that there's a change. There's been an imbalance of power in certain areas that people who have felt that they did not have power the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement, they give those individuals power. And you will see a lot of that, that that's coming to the workplace. And then how are you going to respond to it? Once you've been named as someone who, what, what, are you Google? And all of a sudden you're dealing with a strike. Or are you in another situation where you're dealing with a customer complaint about how someone is behaving? You'll see instances, I think there's just an article this past weekend from the New York Times about the hospitality industry in the New York area having uh, beepers regarding uh, customers in their hotels because that's a serious concern. How are you going to address the concern and whether you're going to address the concern? You know, clear patterns of abuse still exist in all workplaces. I would submit my experience is a lot of the harassment issues are heightened in the hospitality industry. Just the nature of it doesn't mean they're worse people. It means if behavior has been accepted for so long, it's hard to change. And if you're in an environment where this is how people have acted for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, it's hard to change. You're also seeing other issues where the HR departments or other people making those decisions are being accused. And that can be hard. Online, I've had a number of clients in tears because they've been accused on Facebook of permitting discrimination, harassment in the workplace or any other environment that is so prevalent that people may not say something to your face, they can go online and they have no problem telling the world about something, which I find shocking, but it absolutely happens. It's not, this is not just a male problem. And this is not just a heterosexual problem. This is a problem for everyone in the world whether it's a straight male, homosexual male, straight woman, homosexual woman, transgendered person, cisgendered person, it does not matter. These are problems, and it's, I, I say the term problems, that's probably the wrong term. These are issues that affect us all, and then how we deal with those issues are gonna be what type of work environment that we're in. The part where most people hate attorneys, they hate HR, and they hate this topic, it's almost all gray. So it makes it difficult. There are some black and white issues. You absolutely can say this. You absolutely cannot do that. But most of what you're dealing with and most of the hard problems are going to be the gray areas and then how you respond to it. The biggest key in my experience on those gray areas is you set clear boundaries as clear as you can through the gray. And there's going to be missteps, and that's fine. That you're going to make decisions here that, eh, that was OK. And then a month later, the same thing happened. You've had time to think about it, and you're like, I see a problem here. It's OK to correct ship. It's OK to move things. Don't feel like because you took one action a month ago, you can never change it. We want to be consistent, but we also want to look back and see, is this a bigger problem than what I thought? Uh, Non-disclosure agreements, you will see, um, you probably
probably, if you've entered into them, they have a confidentiality provision or a non-disclosure provision. If any of you think that your employees are not going to talk to one another and that that news of what has happened before the person even signed the agreement, I think you're probably kidding yourself. You can still put them in there, we can still enforce it, you can still do that. You just need to be aware that that's not going to stop your problem. The other piece of it is, is even if that person a number of times, they know there was a problem, they don't know how it was resolved, you'll talk to employees, their idea of how it got resolved are, is almost always infinitely worse than what really happened. Nine, you'll look at this, it goes back to the other things. More of what we're seeing with the Me Too movement is they are not looking to their state government, they're not looking to their federal government. They're looking at businesses and corporations to make things right. And that is a very millennial type viewpoint on it, but they're much more likely to try to take action with the corporation than they are to go to their state senator. And so you need to be aware of it. The other millennial issue that you will see, they'll go directly to the CEO of the company with an email. There's a number of times I will see something that's gone down from the CEO down to the ops manager, down to the district manager, down to wherever, and to you'll have a complaint of some issue. We need to treat that just like if they went to the HR person in their office. And the last one with the Me Too movement, public and private are harder and harder to differentiate. That it is much harder and it's no longer the case to say, the bell went off, I went across the street, I grabbed some beers with some friends who happened to be some coworkers, Maybe we had too much to drink, some things were said, but then you go to back to work and everything's fine. That is harder and harder. And in fact, when you go back online, you'll see this as well. Oftentimes you'll see people on their breaks going to Facebook, going to Twitter. They may not even be on their breaks, we're being honest. Probably not. But let's give them benefit of the doubt. So what are you dealing with in situations where you're dealing with complaints at the time? You're like, well, that person was on site, and now their Facebook is saying they're being treated terribly. How am I going to handle these situations? The old response was usually, honestly, I'm probably going to ignore it. That is becoming less and less acceptable in how you do business. The Me Too movement is mostly dealing with sexual harassment. It's not solely about sexual harassment. And so how I would ask all of my clients to handle it, it's about respect in the workplace. Whether that respect is for whatever reason, it's important to keep that respect of all individuals going forward. And it becomes harder and harder. The pro you're not always going to do the right thing or the perfect thing. But the what you want to do is you're taking action. You are trying to do the right thing. And you're letting your employees know about it. And you're bringing your employees in. And you're doing it in a way to protect you later on, both as a company and as individuals. So that ends it today. If you have any questions, you can email me. Or if you want copies of any material, I'd be happy to give it to you. Do we have any questions?